I wanted to talk about shorebirds. And as I mentioned, uh, these are really some of the most spectacular long distance migrant birds in the world. Many of them are spanning almost the entire hemisphere in annual migrations. And as such, I refer to them as birds of the wind. The shorebirds are divided into three major families. They include the plovers. We have five species in Wisconsin, including a very common one, the killdeer, and also an endangered species, the piping plover a very small group of the stilts and avocets, and a family of sandpipers, which is comprised of more than 30 species in Wisconsin. And many people actually think of shorebirds and sandpipers as synonymous, though we do include these other families. Because these are such long distant migrants, they will wander and among some of the rare or extremely rare birds are even some European species that have been sighted in Wisconsin periodically or Western birds that will drift our way. Others are uh, annual migrants that we'll see uh, in spring and fall as they come and go here in Wisconsin. The killdeer is certainly the most common of these. And by the way, their first reports are coming in. Killdeer are just beginning to arrive. This is a bit of an exception because it's one of the few shorebirds that actually nests in Wisconsin. And it's uh, an early migrant because it's a relatively short distant migrant, which also makes it a bit of an exception. They're just simply traveling to the southern U.S. and Mexico, sometimes into Central America for wintering grounds. The spotted sandpiper is another common breeding bird in Wisconsin. We'll see them along the lake shores and rivers across the state and throughout much of the country. And this is somewhat of an intermediate migrant. As you see from the range map, the orange indicates its breeding range, so it covers most of the central northern U.S. and a large part of Canada, and in winter. They're simply going to the southern U.S., Mexico, and as far as the northern part of South America. But overall, we really think of shorebirds as long-distance migrants, and the Baird Sandpiper represents that. Here's a bird that I uh, photographed in Bolivia. This is the northern edge of its wintering range, and also in a perched wetland uh, over 13,000 feet. The range map shows that the Baird Sandpiper is spending its winter in the far southern part of South America, and I've actually encountered them all the way down to Tierra del Fuego. In migration, they come up the mid part of the continent, so they do stop over in Wisconsin. And note the breeding range is in the high Arctic, well above the Arctic Circle. From the southernmost edge of the wintering ground to breeding grounds is 10,000 miles, which they cover twice a year. And this is actually quite typical of our shorebirds. Another long distance migrant is the Wimbrel. This is a very large sandpiper. And uh, this is a bird that uh, we encountered on the Pacific coast of Chile on its wintering ground. And in fact, the population that winters on the Pacific side of South America follows a different migratory route from those on the Atlantic. But the Wimbrel shows us something about the real site fidelity of these birds in migration. This is from a study of a bird that was captured in Virginia and outfitted with a radio tag and then followed for the following four years. The bird had a habit of flying north to James Bay and southern Hudson Bay, cutting across Canada past Great Slave Lake, Bear Lake, to its nesting ground at the Mackenzie River Delta. On its way back, it follows a more northerly route to Southampton Island to the west coast of Hudson Bay and James Bay, stops again at Virginia and winters here in the Virgin Island and the bird has also had continued south to uh, wintering sites in Brazil. But notice the leapfrogging habit of this bird. From the Virgin Islands, always stopping at Virginia, going up to Hudson Bay and making its way to its breeding ground. And this is quite typical of these long distance migrants. They may cover hundreds or even a few thousand miles in a single flight then stop at these specific areas, rest, fuel up, and head on again. So this also raises the concern, what happens at a critical site like the coast of Virginia? If all of a sudden there's an oil spill or development of the site as a harbor or marina, or is somehow that habitat is altered or lost, these birds are then having to search out for other sites that will accommodate them. And so this is very typical of these birds in their migration that they have these long flights and very much seek out very specific resting sites along the way. 
Another study that was conducted within just the last 10 years revealed something absolutely amazing of these birds. This is the bar-tailed godwit. It's a bird of the Pacific, uh, but it's related to the Hudsonian and marble godwit that we see in Wisconsin. These birds winter in New Zealand and they make a few stopovers like the Wimbrel, the northern part of Australia, they'll fly to the Yellow Sea coast of China and southern Japan, stop at Korea and then to their nesting site, which is western Alaska and far eastern Siberia. The population had declined by nearly 50% over the decades and there was a real concern among scientists as to what may be the cause and what could we do to alter this. So they knew these birds were stopping traditionally at these sites on the way north. And of course, with uh, rapid development in China and also South Korea, there's been some alterations to their coastal areas. And uh, this was certainly a concern for impact of stopover sites. But a mystery remained, where were these birds stopping in the fall time and was that the problem? And there were very few sightings of these birds in fall migration. So being outfitted with a radio transmitter or GPS, they tracked these birds. And what it revealed was one of the most outstanding migrations of any bird in the world. The reason they didn't see these birds in fall migration is because they didn't stop. Very typical, one single bird was tracked following, flying the entire length from Alaska to New Zealand nonstop, a distance of more than 7,500 miles, and it flew for nine days and nine nights never quit because they, they don't float. They don't swim like other uh, water birds. So these birds make a nonstop flight covering almost the entire length of the Pacific Ocean in one shot. Of course, this now raises the question, how do they even do this? What's the physiology? That remains even um, more of a mystery, but we've just learned here within the last few years, these birds have these outstanding capabilities of covering these long distances which means that these fueling sites where they're resting and feeding before are critically important. We also have likewise found that the red knot makes a regular flight from the New England coast to Brazil and Argentina in one shot, 6,000 plus miles. So this seems to be maybe more the norm for some of these shorebirds rather than exception. In the United States, a lot of our shorebirds are moving up the Atlantic coast. And here we have ideal feeding sites because these are the tidal flats where twice a day we get the receding water and the exposure of these mud flats, which provide good feeding and resting sites. Of course, not all shorebirds follow the coast, and uh, we do have shorebirds that are regularly seen in Wisconsin. Here along the coastal area, by the way, we have the willets, which are feeding in the surf as the tide's going out, food is being washed up to them, and of course the mud's being exposed. So these are really reliable sites for shorebirds. In the mid part of the continent, that's not the case. So here we have the migration of the American golden plover. This bird winters in Argentina in the grasslands of the Pampas, south of the Amazon rainforest, flies up the mid part of the continent in spring to breeding grounds right around and well above the Arctic Circle. And in the fall, it may follow a different route. They shift over to the North New England coast, North Atlantic coast, and from there, fuel up and make a nonstop flight of about 8,000 miles all the way to Argentina. By the way, the bird on the right that you're seeing is an individual on its breeding ground. And I photographed that on Northern Baffin Island, 500 miles above the Arctic Circle. In Wisconsin, our shorebirds are primarily what we refer to as passage migrants. They're just passing through. They stop over for a short while and then move on to uh, breeding grounds in the Canadian Arctic. So we're really hosting these birds for a short time on these long journeys. And these are the sites that they're seeking out. Obviously we don't have tidal flats, so they're looking for areas of shallow standing water and exposed mud flat. One of the problems is that in Wisconsin, like other agricultural areas, Many of these low-lying areas have been developed into cropland, and in order to dry out the soils early enough for planting, many of these have been tiled. So farmers are trying to get rid of water, and as a result, a lot of these sites do not uh, really exist anymore as ephemeral wetlands. And it becomes more challenging as we have lost than the available shorebird stopover site. 
but this is what they're looking for, those shallow water areas. And in springtime, you will commonly see what looks like ideal shorebird habitat of flooded fields, shallow water and exposed mud, but nothing is sitting on it. And it's not just that we need to have that mud flat and sheet water condition, obviously we need food. And not all of these sites are supporting abundant invertebrate populations. And so shorebirds are really seeking out then areas with the right water level in springtime. And of course, areas where vegetation is decomposing, which are providing that detritus and food matter for the invertebrates that they feed on. And here's some of the common shorebirds in these little mud flats, the Dunlins, the Wilson's phalarope, wading in this uh, sheet water, shallow water, and probing then in the mud or picking uh, invertebrates out of the water column or surface. The northern states like Wisconsin are critically important to these migrants. It's not only a stopover point for them, but it's literally the last stop for many of these birds before the breeding grounds. So when they arrive in Wisconsin, they're looking for these sites to rest, refuel, fatten up on the invertebrate food source, and then will make a nonstop flight to the Arctic breeding grounds. Far northern Wisconsin and throughout much of southern Canada is all spruce forest, which is not shorebird habitat, and it's also underlain by the Canadian Shield, which really does not support good wetland areas. So these birds are overshooting that, and the fuel energy that they're building up in Wisconsin is not just fat reserves to get them to the breeding grounds, but the excess fat that remains is used then for egg production. So in other words, these northern states are critical not only as the last stopover for birds, but are directly related to nesting success on the Arctic breeding grounds. Here's a shot of the Arctic breeding grounds along Hudson Bay. These are the Hudson Bay lowlands. And as we're flying over, you can see from the air, the character. It is underlain with permafrost. So in spring, as the snow is melting, the water can't soak in from that ice layer underneath. And it is so flat, it doesn't drain off. And so this provides that nice interspersion of ponds, shallow water, and low-lying uplands, which are incredible wildlife habitat for shorebirds and others that utilize these areas. Here we see that Arctic tundra uh, with the purple saxifrage in the foreground and the mix of pools of uh, various water depths around it as feeding areas for these birds. Some of the birds on the breeding ground we encounter there are semi-palmated plover. And you see the character of the nest. It's simply a little scrape in the pebbles and the eggs are very camouflaged. And so they just simply uh, make the most simple nest on the ground. Some of them are looking for a gravel substrate. Other, like semi-palmated sandpiper, are in the low vegetation. It is just off its nest. The nest is right behind it, just a little depression within the vegetation. And likewise, the American golden plover makes a very similar nest. Nests for shorebirds are fairly typical for most of the species. They tend to lay four eggs. The eggs are very large relative to the body size of the bird. And they tend to pack them with a point to the middle so they keep them nice and compact so the adult can incubate all four of these. The eggs, as I said, are relatively large to the body size, and that's because they hatch out precocial young. In other words, like geese, ducks, turkeys, the day these young hatch out, they're fully feathered and able to run around, so they're not like songbirds uh, hatched out prematurely and need to be reared in the nest before they fledge. So as I said, Wisconsin, most of our shorebirds are passage migrants. These are birds that are just stopping over on their way to and from these Arctic breeding grounds. We see the shorebirds right now, the earliest ones are just beginning to arrive. The killdeer is always a little out of sync as we get into sometimes uh, early mid-April, occasionally at the end of March. But uh, a little later on, we tend to see the first arriving sandpipers and the real peak is the month of May and into the first week of June. This is when they're fueling up and also about the time they depart, the Arctic is beginning to thaw out. We'll actually see the birds return again in about uh, mid-July and throughout August. This is the so-called fall migration, which for us is, of course, the height of summer. The first birds to return are non-breeding and breeding males. So we assume that a lot of these males are arriving on the breeding ground, establishing a territory, 
successfully or unsuccessfully mating, and then they depart. And since the uh, adults are rearing precocial young, they don't require parental care, just more guardianship. So the males come down first, and then later on, as the Arctic comes to the close of a very brief summer, the young and females will follow. And among some species, they fly independently, which means the young are heading to their own wintering grounds with some uh, kind of an advanced knowledge of where they're actually heading to, another mystery. So these are the stopover sites. As I say, we need to have that shallow water and abundant food source. This is where they're resting on their way north in Wisconsin during that spring and fall uh, period. The main food they're looking for is the midge larva or the common bloodworm. These uh, invertebrate uh, larvae, they live in oxygen depleted soils. They're living off of detritus, the de decomposing vegetation, and they're extremely rich in both protein and fats. So this and other invertebrates make up the primary food source for these shorebirds. Now the shorebirds, if you look at a good pond, will be scattered around some at the very edge, standing just in moist soil, some in just a little bit of water and others wading into maybe four to six inches of water or more. And essentially the bigger shorebirds get out in the deeper water. And the length of the bill and length of the leg among the different species correlates with the water depth where they feed. So birds with longer legs, bigger beaks are out in deeper water, others in the shallows, or in this case are killdeer, even in the uplands where the soil is moist extracting any food. Here we see killdeer about as close as we normally see them in water. They don't like to get their feet too wet, so they're up in, on the edge here on that moist soil. Its close cousin, the semi-palmated plover, is also feeding in the same areas. So at the most, you'll see them just barely getting their toes wet, so they're feeding around the fringes of these flooded fields. The least sandpiper is appropriately named. The smallest of our sandpipers, about the size of a sparrow. They will wade into water, but since he's such a tiny bird, about one inch of water is about it for them as they go into just the edges here of flooded areas to extract their food. Solitary sandpiper is a nice example of a mid-sized bird. And here's a bird that will wade in a little bit deeper. It has a medium length bill, and so we'll be picking the food out of some of these shallow to slightly deeper water areas beyond the smallest sandpiper. And then short billed dowager, this is a fairly large bird and an extremely long bill. They will wade in all the way to their bellies. And of course, with that long bill probing deep into the water and mud and able to extract food that is far out of reach of many other sandpipers. And they share these deeper areas with the larger ones like the Hudsonian godwit. So we'll see that in a flooded field, they actually stagger themselves and segregate themselves by the water depth. And so a single pond may have a dozen, 15 or more species. And as they stratify themselves across these areas for different feeding strategies to uh, uh, secure their food, we can find that these areas can hold an awful lot of uh, a variety of birds. So there are different foraging gills not only of where the birds feed, but even how they feed. So as we see here, the semi-palmated plover, least sandpiper, these are the smaller, medium-sized birds. They tend to be in the shallow water. Yellow legs will be in deeper water. And these are also birds that we call the pickers or gleaners. So they are actually picking the invertebrates off of the surface uh, of the water, off of the uh, soil, or just uh, any uh, floating or rotting vegetation. We have another group of birds called the probers. These are like the short-billed dow, which are using those long bills to actually probe into the mud and substrate and looking for the invertebrates there. And then we have another unique group, the avocet is a sweeper. So let's take a closer look at some of these. Among our pickers are the ruddy turnstone. It has a relatively short bill picking the invertebrates and food stuff that they can find off the surface. And as its name implies, they're actually turning stones or little debris out there. So things that are being hidden from other birds, they're able to find that and work around some of their competitors. The lesser yellow legs is also a picker, but a, a fairly good sized sandpiper. They'll walk out into the water and looking for food within the water column or off the surface. 
Same with the black neck stilt. Those extremely long legs allows them to wade fairly deep, but the bill is uh, modest length and very thin for picking in, uh, its food uh, out of the water and off the water surface. Phalaropes are swimmers, kind of an exception among our so shorebirds. Uh, the Wilson's phalarope is our most common in Wisconsin. Here's a picture of its cousin, redneck phalarope. They'll be out in water eight to 12 inches deep and actually swimming out there. And a common habit is to spin in circles to churn up a little bit of the invertebrates, mosquito larvae and other things, and to pick those out of the water column. So those are the pickers. Here are our probers. We saw the short-billed dowager earlier using that bill to dagger-like dig into the, the mud and down in the water looking for food. And bird watchers commonly recognize dowagers by a habit that they describe as feeding like a sewing machine. So you'll see them pushing that bill up and down, up and down, looking for food uh, in that uh, the mud, trying to uh, locate uh, some of the bigger food. And here, Marble Godwit, one of our largest of the sandpipers we'll find. Here we see him with a little morsel that he found. This guy's a prober and he's able to find food that is way out of the reach of anyone else because of those long legs and of course that extremely long bill. And here we see just how deep they'll go. Uh, here again, we see that specialization, being able to feed side by side with other birds and he's able to locate food that's way out of reach of everyone else. And likewise, the wimbrel, another very large bird, very stout, heavy bill, able to pick up larger food stuff. And so there's this real specialization among them. And that's what not only makes shorebird watching interesting, but at the same time, we also find that a good shorebird pond can host side by side many, many species. And here's our avocet. We mentioned that this is a sweeper. So this bird is still in this winter plumage. They'll walk out into the water and use that upturned bill to sweep back and forth looking for what is in the water column itself. And here we see he's captured a young carp as food for the day. So these are all examples of specialization among the different feeding strategies of all these different species. So if we look at the foraging ecology and habitat requirements, our migrating shorebirds require a few important things. First of all, mud flats or shorelines and shallow water, one to two inches deep uh, for the most part, and then about 75% unvegetated uh, substrate or what we call a sheet water. So in other words, it's not a dry, relatively dry cattail marsh. We need this big open uh, stretch with very little vegetation or what vegetation is, it's lying on the ground underwater decomposing. You also need an abundant invertebrate uh, source. So at least a hundred individuals per square meter or more. And as we mentioned, the curinomids, the midges or bloodworms are really one of the primary food sources. During migration, shorebirds congregate in these shallow wetlands where water is receding after the spring melt and where bloodworms have overwintered. So if we're going to manage for shorebirds, we should try to really imitate these kinds of conditions. And shorebirds also respond to variation in the prey density and exploit different foraging sites. And as we said, based on the water depth and also invertebrate abundance. So commonly you'll see a large area of exposed mud and the shorebirds may be crowded into one corner where the food is uh, at its highest uh, density. So management of shorebirds can be done in the Midwest. And I've been advocating for this for many years. Myself and uh, my good friend and colleague Sumner Madison have run workshops for professionals and we keep trying to get this idea out there so that we can actually do something intentionally for these birds. Many of our state and federal waterfall areas, the wildlife areas are reclaimed or uh, restored wetland sites. So following drainage of many of these, uh, they have been restored through a dike construction and uh, low level dams to hold back water. Here we see a couple of impoundments that have been recreated at a place like Horicon Marsh. So these were waterfall projects originally. Of course, they do attract a good variety of birds, but for waterfall management and most wetland management uh, objectives, they try to keep the water levels fairly high to accommodate ducks and other birds like that, which unfortunately is too deep for the shorebirds. But there is a way to manage these same sites without interfering with the duck management objectives. 
So as I said, a lot of these places, uh, water level have been restored and water control has been done by construction of dikes. Here we see a renovation of a dike at Teresa Marsh. So gravel is brought in to create this low level dam as an enclosure around an area to capture that water. The dike is then also uh, pierced through with a culvert and water control structure. These can be active or passive water control structures. This one here, passive, you see the little elbow at the end. Uh, that basically means the water rises up to that point and spills over so it doesn't go over the top of the dike or if it's a highway that's uh, separating it does not flood public roads. Here we see a little more active um, water level management. This is a culvert, but you notice the channel iron on each side. Boards can be fitted in here and just slide the boards in and create a small dam and the water will rise until it overtops that. And so we can regulate the water or even release it by removing a few boards. Or we can do more active management by actually and physically pumping water uh, either with permanent pumping stations or here we have a tractor and running off the power takeoff unit is a Crisofoli pump and so we can physically move that water. Unfortunately, the drawback is that it's quite expensive to run these for a week or more to be able to draw down acres and acres of water. But here's what we do. This is actually part of duck management. If you leave a wetland alone with that water high all the time, you'll see more and more encroachment of cattails and good shelter for birds, but we're losing the food. And under these shallow water areas are literally billions of seeds that are ready to germinate, but they need oxygen. So managers will regularly draw these down, but usually beginning more in June to expose the soil. And here we see an impoundment, the water's been drawn down. There's all that detritus, that's food for the invertebrates and that rotting vegetation now is exposed, and so are the seeds. Within a very short time, the seeds germinate, everything greens up, looks like a putting green, and within just a month or so, everything starts to emerge. And what we're seeing in the far back, the pink, these are all uh, smart weeds, which are very abundant with its seed crop. In the foreground is nutsedge and bidens, and these are all food sources for ducks. So come late summer, these are reflooded. The ducks now have access to all that food. And so we're actually then providing a great feeding area for ducks by managing water levels. But it's a matter of timing where we can actually do these drawdowns to benefit the ducks and at the same time create our shorebird habitat. So the ducks can take advantage of these sites, both as the water is receding in spring, concentrating the food and just prior to their migration and nesting, and uh, also in fall time when it's all greened up again with lush food. But our migrant ducks in Wisconsin depart about the third week of April. So right now we're starting to see the first spring weather and anywhere usually in about the month of March, the uh, lakes and, sh and shallow wetlands begin to open. That's when the ducks arrive, as soon as there's open water. And by the third week of April, they're starting to pull out to either go further north to breeding grounds or the local birds are starting to breed. So if we start to draw down the water already in mid-April, the ducks are getting ready to leave anyhow and we should slowly start to create then the ideal conditions as the shorebirds are coming in at the end of April and throughout May. And so this is a way that we can accommodate the migrant ducks in springtime and just as they depart or begin to nest locally, uh, we can have those water levels drawn down and also provide for the shorebird during the migration. If we're going to do this, we need to create a detrital food source. In other words, that decomposing vegetation, which is the food for the invertebrates. We start with a drawdown very slowly, lowering the water about one to two inches per week. These are time drawdowns with the peak of the migration of birds. So late April to early June, we should have these drawn down or if we're going to accommodate them in fall migration, late July through September or so. If you have more than one impoundment, we can actually then draw one down for spring and one down for fall, rotate that, and occasionally when the soil is dry enough, we can even then disc the site, aerate it, and then even create a little bit of lumpiness out there so when we flood it, it's not all at one uniform depth, but create that variation in water depth for the different species of shorebirds. In the early 2000s, Sumner and myself actually recruited a number of state wildlife managers to attempt to do this as a 
pilot program, we found managers at three areas that had the right conditions and opportunities to regulate water levels and also were willing to cooperate the program. And it turned out nicely, we had them in different geographic corners of the state, the Southeast, Central and Northwest. And this uh, really was an interesting project for us because it proved one thing, and that is that no matter how hard you try to create the conditions, it's always at the whims of nature. And so Teresa Marsh, for example, the manager was drawing down the water levels, was just creating ideal conditions. I watched the shorebirds showing up in really good numbers, and then we had a rain event. And of course, it captured all the water from the upland surrounding that area. The impoundment began to flood. It was now too deep for the shorebirds, and with that, we missed it. Mead Wildlife Area was a good site. It accommodated a good number of birds. They were not flooded out, and it turned out that Crex was excellent. So we had poor, good, and excellent sites, and it was a matter of the weather. So again, you can attempt to do these drawdowns in springtime. You can plan for everything, but with the extremities of weather, if we all of a sudden get into a rain event, we can flood them out. And as we saw, the water control structure is like a bottleneck. It's hard to release enough water quick enough to create those conditions again. So we may miss it then. Or on the other hand, if you're drawing your water down and you're just getting good exposed mud, and then we go to an extended drought and high temperatures, it may go from mud to just baked dirt. And they're really hard to reflood because it's very expensive and difficult to pump water back uphill again to reflood these sites. But the point is this, if we have enough people trying in enough areas, in any year, somebody will hit it just right. And the shorebirds in the central part of the continent are real nomads. They're looking for the right site. Unlike the uh, coastal areas where ideal habitat is provided twice a day from the tidal action, here these birds are at the whims of nature and have always been looking for these sites. So I really think that we can make a concerted effort to attempt to intentionally provide good shorebird habitat, which is critical for birds that we're finding are having some real serious problems these days. So we can try to then provide this kind of condition that stop over habitat and to lure these birds in and give them that chance where they can rest, refuel, and head north the way that they've always done. And really good conditions in some of these areas will lure in hundreds of individuals and oftentimes many different species. I've seen good shorebird ponds with 12, 15 or more species in a single pond. So the shorebird management is not a single species management program. We're really providing for an entire guild of birds at a critical time in their life cycle. Because of the concerns over shorebirds, there is now the strategic planning process underway to develop a comprehensive plan for shorebird conservation. I participated recently in the Upper Mississippi uh, and Great Lakes uh, Regional uh, uh, Strategic Planning Group and also Lower Mississippi Gulf Coast Plan. And for each of these, we're looking at ecoregions that each host a different group of birds and also have different environmental conditions and opportunities and also different conservation concerns. So very strategically, we're dividing up the entire country between that North Atlantic, which is quite of a different situation from the Southern Plain from say the, uh, the Great Plains, the Upper Mississippi or Pacific. Likewise, Canada is doing the same thing on a regional approach and slowly we're working with Mexico, Central America and all of South America and rolling this into an entire Western Hemispheric comprehensive shorebird conservation initiative. So we're hoping that this will start to prove some results and help to keep these birds because after all, shorebirds are truly some of the most amazing migrant birds in the world, some of these birds spanning the entire length of the hemisphere. And our real uh, intention here is these marvelous birds, we wanna keep them going. And we think that we can actually provide this through good conservation efforts and be able to then save these birds and recover some populations. So I wanna thank everyone for their time attention. I appreciate your patience with the technical difficulties we had, and I'll be glad to answer any questions. Thank you so much. All right, that was great. Thanks a lot, Bill. Um, we do have one question here. Uh, do you have recommendations for natural areas protection in Wisconsin that would benefit shorebirds? 
Well, I think the main thing for shorebirds is you either need a site that is uh, the right kind of uh, hydrological conditions that will flood periodically. And again, it may not be good in every single year. And these uh, sites also may have to be actively managed because it's either we physically have to have the capability of managing water levels, or if it's a site that has a good hydrology, you also have to watch that it doesn't become choked with uh, vegetation. So it may have to be tilled periodically. So uh, actually, uh, if you rent this out to a farmer, let him try crop for in a summer it's dry or so, and then let it reflood, might be a good cooperative effort. Yeah, so some site specific maybe recommendations. As I said, I think our greatest capability is on these public managed wetlands where we have actually engineered them with the dikes and water control structures. The problem here or challenge then would be to take what are really uh, wildlife biologists that have been focused on duck management and get them to understand shorebird ecology and to be able to roll that into a larger, more comprehensive management approach. Yep, as a, as a waterfowl biologist, I agree wholeheartedly. <laughs> and it is one of those groups of birds that a lot of people are not that familiar with, and even for bird watchers, uh, because there's a lot of lookalikes and they're so diverse, it's a group that even bird watchers have an apprehension of trying to weed through and identify them all. So it is somewhat of a neglected group. But as I say, I think it's time that they really deserve our attention and they need it. Yeah, yeah, couldn't agree more. Um, I think we'll wrap it up there. We're just a, a few minutes over, but we've got a break now. So um, again, just thanks a lot, Bill. That was that was uh, that was awesome. And, well, uh, thank you so much. My pleasure, and I'm glad we're able to uh, get everything to work here this morning. Thanks yeah. so much. Hopefully, we can do this in person next time. Yeah, definitely. Um, so next up, we've got a. a just about 10 more minutes uh, until our next speaker, Summer Madison, will uh, talk to us about the Wisconsin Trumpeter Plan uh, recovery program. And uh, so we'll take about a 10 minute break and then we'll see you back um, for Sumner Madison's talk. All right. Thanks everyone. Thank you.